everyone, thank you for coming today. My name is James Strong. We're going to talk about understanding Kubernetes networking in 30 minutes, or as I like to call a Mario speed run through Kubernetes networking. Um, my name is James Strong, like I said, I've already done that. I'm a solutions architect at Isovalent now, which is a part of Cisco. I am a maintainer of Ingress Nginx, so if you have any questions about that, uh, ask me in an hour at my next talk, um, so I won't be taking those questions. I'm also the author of Networking Kubernetes. I have an A-Cloud Guru course on the same thing. And um, unfortunately, uh, I could not bring my Gimli cosplay here, but I do have a full Gimli cosplay outfit. Cool. My name is Ricardo. I am a software engineer at VMware by Broadcom. Uh, I have created the Cubebook. I don't know if someone still uses that. Like, it's kind of broken those days. Uh, <laughs> like Ingress? Like Ingress and Ginex. I'm one of the maintainers of Ingress and Ginex. So everything that I touch usually breaks. Sorry. And he I, breaks it, I approve it. Yeah, <clears throat> and I am a Lego enthusiast, so I, I love Legos. So today we're going to talk about understanding Linux, uh, <laughs> Kubernetes networking, but one of the, when I was first learning Kubernetes, one of the old adages was that, you know, Kubernetes is just Linux, and um, sorry for any of the Windows folks out there, we will not be talking about that one. And when we say this, um, I like to bring up this picture I found. This is a great one for the talk. Um, for those who don't know, this is the data flow of a packet through the kernel. So um, we're setting the bar really low for us, so let's strap in. So our agenda, we're going to talk about Linux networking. We're going to talk about what a pod is, what's, uh, what part of it is, and talk about container networking and how we build those Kubernetes abstractions on top of Linux. Ricardo, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. So uh, we are going to start doing some demos in a, in a minute, but uh, I want you, you don't need to take pictures. We are going to put that on the schedule, I promise. There's lots of pictures, so. Yes. So uh, this is how uh, a Kubernetes networking actually looks like. And we are going to actually start building our networking over this with demos and showing like uh, how the routing actually works, why we have a core DNS, and what's Kube proxy, and why everyone actually hates Kube proxy. <laughs> I can't say anything. Sorry. Yeah. So we'll start by talking about Linux networking and what the network networking stack is. So the base of every Kubernetes workload is working on a node. A node has an Ethernet interface for an external connectivity. Uh, we would say it has routing rules so we know where to send packets. Um, IP tables so that we can break things with those packets and maybe black hole some of them. And then we have connection tracking um, contract pretty straightforward name. It makes, you know, it tracks the connections inside of the kernel for us. And uh, at a very simplistic terms, this is what we would consider the Linux networking stack. Um, it's not everything. There's lots of other things that are involved in this. But for simplicity and 30 minutes stake, let's think that this is the Linux networking stack. With that, we're going to talk about how that gets replicated in a pod. And Ricardo wanted to make sure that we talked about this guy, the pause container. Okay, so uh, whoever actually entered into the node and did like a Docker PS and saw a bunch of pauses and wasn't, had no idea what that thing was about. Great. Okay, so when you start a pod, you need somewhere to have the network, right? Because a pod is just like, uh, you know, a network that is shared between containers. So the pause, it's what we call the infrastructure container. It's a container that is created just to be there. So you can start creating the other things. It's a container that will be there and won't be on crash loopback or something like that, right? So that's what the pause is. It's just a container that should be started and should be there so you can have network. And with that, we have containers. So our actual applications are running inside of this pod. And it is part of that pod namespace. But what is that pod namespace or network namespace there? It is a complete copy of the Linux networking stack. This is, what is, this is what allows us, as app developers, to run something on port 8080 multiple different times. So we have multiple applications running on the same port. It's because you have a copy of the Linux networking stack. So if you ever see sometimes when you try to run you know, several copies of Nginx on a host node, you'll get port conflicts, because by default it runs on 80. This is uh, why we can do this inside of containers. And so container, uh, pods run on nodes, right? We need a node until somebody figures out how to not do that. Even in ECS, you still need a node. <laughs> and on a node, you have what is called the, the root network namespace. And that's where, you know, by default, all interfaces go unless you tell it not to. So we've created, we've got the container, we've got the pod 
network namespace. We've also added a, an interface in there so that we have, again, an interface that runs on there. But how do these two communicate? Again, we have um, technology called the Ethernet. V Ethernet is, think of it as uh, just a pipe between the two interfaces. Packet comes in, packet goes out. Packet comes in, packet goes out. And these two are connected by another Linux technology called a bridge. And then, again, we like to reiterate that, you know, all of these commands here are from the Linux command line. You can, there was actually a really good talk, and I think it was reInvent a couple years ago where someone actually, you know, recreated a container with all of these commands. So, again, trying to reiterate all this there, it's just Linux underneath the hood. And then we wire those, the bridge up. So now we have external connectivity between our pod network namespace and our root, ne root network namespace. And then we have this beautiful picture here. Multiple nodes, multiple copies of the network stack. And I think I'm missing the demo, no, the demo slide. No. Oh, you moved it? Oh, see. You <laughs> this is what I get for working with you, Ricardo. <laughs> So we're gonna talk about um, how all of this um, works together and how we make those Kubernetes um, extractions. I like to call them the Kubernetes Networking Fight Club rules. And so we talked about um, that, um, the pod container, the pod, the two containers talking to each other through that network namespace. And so we get this first rule, highly coupled container to container communication is solved by local host communication. So this is a complete copy of the network stack. So these two processes can talk to each other over local host. Pod to pod communication. All pods can communicate with other pods and um, with their own IP addresses. And this is, again, worked through with the V Ethernet and the bridging interfaces. We haven't talked about services yet, but how to get pod to services communication is covered by Kubernetes service. So again, that's another abstraction. Um, ignore the fact that Kubernetes is spelled wrong. Exter external to services communication. So everything that we've been talking about up till now has been internal to the cluster. So how pods can communicate with each other and how the nodes can communicate with each other. So we have to have some way to reach out of the cluster because, you know, Clusters aren't that great if nobody can actually use them, right? Why are we using them? At least it's secure. Is it secure? A secure container, a, a, sec, a secure cluster has no network. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, how those nodes can communicate, and we'll let Ricardo talk about the pod cider. Okay. So uh, I will actually start a demo now. Okay. Cool. Uh, and we are going to understand a bit on these uh, communications and what this means, like uh, one node using the other as a router and how uh, it works on this pot-to-pot uh, -pot communication being transparent. So we are going to start exploring all, all of those rules that James did, but uh, using uh, demos, right? I'll be your mic stand. Oh, thank you. Cool. So uh, we have kind of recorded before because usually I have problems when I don't record. But think that we are actually doing a live demo. Uh, first of all, we are using kind. Who knows here who is kind? Oh, that's great. Okay. So whatever we are going to do here and whatever we are going to test here, we wanted to do in kind because the, the idea is that you can actually explore at your home later and you don't need to pay like a huge effort of money for any cloud provider just to create a Kubernetes cluster to say like, look, those folks, they are actually right or wrong. Feel free to. Probably wrong. Yeah. So. Eskinima play one. Is it fine, the size? Can you guys see it in the back? One more? No? Good. Okay. It looks good. OK. If you need, just yell at us. Like, I'm used to it. James keeps the idea. OK. So the first one, the first demo that we are going to show here is I, I want to show you. I have some uh, Kubernetes pods here. Each of them, they got this uh, IP address differently, right? So this is the pod IP. And let's keep playing here. I want to do a curl. So I went from this pod that it's running on this node, on this worker two, calling this pod running on worker three, right? And it worked it, so we could get hello KubeCon. And if I take a look into the logs here, I'm going to see that the same address that was from my pod got here. So one of those rules that we got, which was like the communication should be flat, right? It's happening here. Cool. Uh, yeah, so we can see here the IP addresses that, that has been used. So let's take a bit a look a bit better on how this. Uh, let me just see if I'm, I have the right demo. Okay, so pod CIDR. Okay, how this actually works, right? 
so again, taking a look into the pods, we can see that we have a different sub-ranges here of network, right? So worker two has like this 10, 244, three, and then worker three, this 10, 244, one, and so on. So uh, those networks, they are kind of seg segmented, se segregated, right? And uh, as you can see here, when you configure Kubernetes, when you create a Kubernetes cluster, usually when you are not using a uh, kind or when you are doing by your own, you configure a, a directive which is called pod CIDR that says, this is the range of IPs that my pods are gonna get, right? And that's internally, they are just used for this uh, internal communication. Uh, usually they don't need to be routable for your network, but it would be good that you don't clash with your network as well. Otherwise, imagine one pod trying to call like your service on the same IP and it's gonna actually try to route internally to, through the uh, server, to the cluster, right? So we can see that the pod subnet here, it's like this 10 244 slash 16. And if we take a look into the nodes configuration, we are gonna see that each node got this pod CIDR spec saying like, okay, so my worker uh, has this 10 244, sorry, two zero, three and one, which actually matches with the IPs that the pods are getting on, on each node, right? Uh, and they have those external IPs as well. So those are the IPs that are like the public node IPs. Uh, and as you can see, when I do an IP route on one of those nodes, uh, it actually what we have is like, okay, so if this node wants to reach the 10.244.10, it should use this IP here, this external IP, 172.18.03. So in fact, what we can see here is that one node can reach each other and they can reach using tunnels, it can be, they can be on the same network, doesn't matter, this is how the CNI, CNI is gonna uh, implement that, right? But you use each of those nodes as routers, okay? Uh, so, oh, you have a C, oh, you have a CVE here, James, cool. So where is that? I've lost the presentation, so let me just come here to whatever we had here. Uh, so taking a look here again, we can see that uh, every uh, node is being used as a router for each of the pods that are running on those routers, right? So you, you, we have se uh, segregated those on, uh, uh, on, on subnets. And the way that it happens, it's with a, a component which is called CNI. So you probably have heard about that, right? We are gonna speak a bit more on that, but the CNI, it's the container network interface, it's the plugin that manages those, uh, those uh, net, the networking of the container. So it is a thing that does all of those IP allocations, it reads the uh, uh, pod CIDR and so on. So that's this configuration that, that exists on every node, and it says, and when kubelet is running, it will read those configurations and say like, okay, cool, so when I'm creating this new pod, I should actually call uh, those scripts here, from, those, from the CNI and then start allocating the IP addresses based on those configurations. Usually when you have kind or when you have like a managed uh, 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 cluster, you don't care much about that, right? Unless you are uh, actually you know, doing something on premises or you are doing something uh, using some different CNI that is being provided by the cloud provider. Okay, so I think we can move. Yeah, there was this pod demo that I already did. So. <laughs> Yeah, you kept using that word, um, CNI, so we're gonna go ahead and discuss that. So, <clears throat> as we were talking about um, adding those interfaces, you saw all of those commands. It can be very cumbersome, very uh, burdensome. So, what this project is, the CNI project, Container Network Interface, it's a separate piece of software. So, one of the things that, especially when you're starting out, you have to understand is that Kubernetes is a collection of software that works together, right? We've got the kubelet, we've got the API server, all of the controllers, those are all separate pieces of software. And then, with the CNI, it helps with a standard way to manage network interfaces. These are open source projects, there's lots of different options, I work for a company that supports one, so Cilium is there. Cube Router, I think, is the default, and then you know, Flannel. There's lots of other ones. There's the repo, you can go check that out. So it is a specification for how to define that file and how to create and add interfaces and manage routes and IP addresses. So we talk about this, the CNI is required to implement that Kubernetes networking model. So we've talked about the Kubernetes networking model, and the CNI implements that for us. And so we ha see here we have that picture, so we continue to build on that picture. So we have the CNI that manages the, inter the interfaces, the routes, and then allocates the IP, address the, the IP addresses and the interfaces for us. So we did mention services when we talked about the Fight Club rules. Um, there are several different types. We, again, have 30 minutes, so we're gonna talk about the two big ones, uh, cluster IP and node port. So you've, one of the 
key characteristics with services is that you know, pods are going to change, pods are going to die, nodes are going to die, those IP addresses will change. And that's not really helpful from a client's perspective, having to memorize and know all those IP addresses. How many of you guys know the IP addresses of your applications? Yeah. So from a services perspective, that gives us a single IP address for an entry point. So if the orange pod here is trying to communicate to the green service, to the green pods, to get information, whatever the API is, the database, whatever is running there, it knows that it can use this IP address to communicate and reach all of those backend services. And I think at this point we have, oh, I also want to show this again, continue to iterate that it's using underlying network, uh, Linux networking technology. So here we've got an IP tables rule that's showing the uh, NAT routing. And I think we've got, no, we've got another, we, we don't have the demo yet. Um, so this, the next one is node port. So from a node port perspective, right, we talked about um, those external IP addresses for the nodes. And if we have an application that's running with a services, of node ports, what Kubernetes will do for us is it allocates a port on each one of those so that I can reach 172.10.1 on 32,767 and it will reach my applications back in for us. So instead of an IP address, I can use the node port service from that one and this will get a little easier when Ricardo demos that for us. Okay. I was gonna say that wh whoever knows the IP from the head, they are not using IPv6 probably, so that's... <laughs> cool, so let's see here. Uh, first of all, uh, as James said, and I think that we are kind of used to, right? So I have the pods here, and I have those IPs, and uh, I can actually, again, do a curl call uh, from my IP, right? So I'm calling this first IP here, and I say, I get, okay, hello, KubeCon. And actually, we have logs, right? But what will happen when I delete that pod, right? So I went to the pod, I'm gonna delete that pod. Uh, I'm kind of, you know, I keep forgetting my thing, so that's why I do kubectl get always. Uh, okay, so the IP of the pod actually changed, right? So actually the node changed. So if we see uh, the pod from the backend was running on, the, on this uh, worker node here, right? So it was the node one, and then it moved it to the node three, and as we've seen before, even the CIDR, the network of that, that, that pods on those, those nodes change it, right? So if I try to call it, I'm gonna get some timeout, cool? Uh, and the way that I can actually uh, solve that, right, for, okay, it's with a service. So the service is an abstraction. It will allocate also an IP, but that IP won't change if I delete the pod, right? So I'm creating a, a cluster IP here. I will take a look into the service IP. Uh, and as we can see, I have now this backend, which is this 1096, 142, 26, right? Uh, just a pause, not the container. Uh, if you think, I'm <laughs> sorry. If you take a look into the second IP here, which is Kubernetes, it ends on one. We are gonna say uh, a, a bit about that IP, specifically IP up later, right? But that's a special service IP. Uh, so now, if I go again to my container, to, to my other pod and do a curl, I'm gonna see that I can call it uh, from the service IP, right, and not from the pod IP anymore, uh, but still the IP that I'm getting here, at least because the, the traffic is internal of, from the cluster, it's the original uh, pod IP, right? And I, now I deleted my backend pod again, uh, the pod IP changed it, and it changed the node again, and if I did a curl to my service, it's still working, right? Uh, behind the scenes, what's happening here, it's, uh, and we are gonna see, we have this component which is called kubeproxy, and it, it's injecting rules on the nodes, saying, okay, so now I have this service IP, and whatever my pods on, the IP, on, on my node, they try to reach the service IP, I will select the pods that are serving the service, and I will reach them. And this is implemented by this concept, which is called this research, which is endpoint slices, right? So uh, when you create a service, you have that YAML file, and you say like, I wanna select all of those pods, and it will keep reconciling that and saying like, okay, so the, the pod IP changes, so I will change on the endpoint slice. And then quick proxy will note that and say like, okay, so the IP changes, so I will change on the rule here, right? Cool. So uh, just, as a, just another example here, so the service IP, it, it's also configurable, right? So as we can see here, uh, during my client configuration, I have set this service IP, but as opposite to the pod IP, it, it's not gonna break on, on CIDRs for the node, it's just gonna allocate this. There are two exceptions, 
IP1 will always be allocated as a service for Kubernetes API. IP10 will be always allocated to the DNS. And we are going to take a look into the DNS later, okay? Other than that, I don't think, I've never seen actually happening, uh, you know, allocating from one to 10, something in the middle. I think it's reserved. But uh, other than that, it will just do random allocations here. Uh, yeah. I'm going to talk. Okay. And here, uh, uh, as James said, like, we have this component, kubeproxy, and I just wanted to show you, like, kubeproxy actually injecting rules on the node. So, uh, as we can see here, I have these NF tables. Uh, we had a talk just earlier today of, like, the maintainers of kubeproxy showing that they have replaced IP tables for NF, NF tables for uh, performance. And we can see there is this table here saying, like, okay, so when I reach port uh, 010 on port 53 TCP or UDP, I will send to DNS endpoints, or this one to the uh, to this backend, and and so on. Okay, cool. Uh, let me see what's the sixth one, and if I should because I yeah. okay. Uh, if I show node part, it's gonna break because I forgot to fix. Do you wanna see it breaking? Shame. Okay, sorry. So just showing how node part works. I think that we still have time. Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. So I am gonna uh, change my service here uh, and make it as a node part, right? So now it's a node part, as we can see here. I have a, a, an external port allocated. This is random as well, and depends on how you configure your API server. Usually it's from the 30,000 to the 32 something. I don't know, but you can extend the range. It's in the docs. Yeah. And, and now I will call, instead of calling the, uh, my internal IP, I'm, I'm going to my node or something external, right? And I'm gonna call the external IP, and as I can see, from any node IP that I call, I can now get into my service, okay? So this, again, it's queue proxy injecting rules, but as the opposite, saying like, whenever you receive a traffic from the external of the cluster reaching this part, you should, on any of those nodes, you should send to any of those pods being backed by uh, the service, right? There are some exceptions, like you can control this behavior, saying like just send to pods on the same node and so on, but we are not gonna go that down, but it's, uh, I'm happy to discuss about that. Cool. Uh, okay, so you keep doing your slides. Keep drawing the pretty pictures. Yeah. Um, so he already did, you already, um, so we're gonna talk about Qproxy again, so Ricardo is talking over his slides like I do. I have that Sorry. problem, it's fine. Uh, so Qproxy again is another piece of software that runs on each node, and it maintains those networking rules that we're talking about. So all those NF tables rules, when a service change, Qproxy is re responsible for changing those, and it uses, like I said, the operating system packet filtering, so IP tables or NF tables, depending on your implementation, it routes all of the traffic. Cilium does an EBPF? EPBF, yeah, if you're using Cilium in Qproxy mode, or Qproxy replacement mode, um, and that's responsible for the services to pod mapping. So again, you don't have to be responsible manually for changing all of those node IP, node IP, uh, uh, pod IPs, we have too many different types of IP addresses. Yeah, so many IPs. And I don't think you have a specific Qproxy demo. You just did that I one. I just did that, yeah. yeah. Okay. You're doing things out of order for me. And we practiced it yesterday, so, you know, too many parts. So IP addresses are hard to remember. We've got a bunch of different types as I'm already stumbling over them. But what about names instead of IP addresses? Um, we'll go ahead and you're going to go ahead and talk about services in core DNS. Yeah, okay. So, uh, again, now we, we do have the uh, service IP, right? And uh, but imagine you have like namespaces, and on all of those namespaces you wanna reproduce an architecture, so you wanna have your backend, and you wanna have your frontend, and you are gonna have the database maybe, all of them on the same namespace, right? So you have production, and you have key A, and you wanna reproduce that. But you don't have the IP, so you create a service IP, right? And when you do that, you will need to probably make your backend speak with your database, and you want to make that reproducible. So Kubernetes, instead of uh, uh, actually had this concept of the DNS of, that we are gonna show on the core DNS, right? That you can say, okay, so instead of calling 1096 whatever, I'm gonna call backend. And when I call backend, core DNS will go and say like, okay, so Ricardo is calling backend.thenamespace.service.cluster.local, and it's gonna translate to us for the same service that is running on my same namespace, right? Okay, so I'm gonna, do you wanna, Push the button? I can, I can yeah, push the button and you can talk. Yeah, cool. All right, we are, we are finally time. That was a good promise. Okay.
Cool. So let's take a look into the uh, DNS and it working, right? So uh, what's going on? Can you, you broke it? Hold on. Okay. So I have the pods, I have the pod IPs here. I'm going to call it. I have the services. I can still do curl against the service, right? Um, I'm just proving you that I didn't change anything from the, my last demo. But now, what happens if I call uh, HTTP and backend, which is, pause it, the service name, right? So with that, if I keep creating the service with the same name on different namespaces, I have reproducible uh, architectures, reproducible blueprints, right? I don't need to keep doing, adding on all of my environment uh, 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 variables or my configuration, the service IP instead of the uh, uh, the name, right? And the way that it happens, um, okay, so I'm gonna get the logs and I'm gonna show you. And then, uh, if you take a look, we have this Core DNS pod running here and it's installed by default. You can replace, but I wouldn't do that. I, 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 know, I don't know why people would do that, actually. It works pretty <laughs> fine. Uh, and if I take a look into my DNS configuration of my pod, what you're gonna see is that the name server, do you remember when I say like the IP.10 is reserved to the DNS server, right? So all of my pods by default, unless you change something on the configuration on the manifest, they will have the IP10 and they will have this search path that says, I will try to search dot, dot namespace dot SVC dot cluster dot local then dot cluster dot local and, and, and so on, right? So this is how DNS works internally on the pod. So you call just the name, the service name, it will go to the DNS and say like, hey, give me this full name here. And the core DNS will go to Kubernetes API, check what's the service API, and return you back that API. Okay? Cool. It's not that And complicated. we're back to the beginning. All of our pieces are there. We've got core DNS, QProxy, CNI, and uh, all of our pods connected. Um, other components to consider, so some of the things, so this is, again, very basic intro to Kubernetes networking. Something to consider is that all of these pods can talk to every other pod um, by default, so you would need something like a network policy that would deny um, connectivity between these pods. So from a security perspective, please implement network policies. And then one thing we didn't talk about um, is ingress controllers and gateway API controllers. So from a... Again, everything that we talked about just now was internal to the cluster, and in 30 minutes we can't really um, go through all of the node port services and all of the abstractions, but this is um, how you get traffic into your cluster from that perspective, from external. Um, we've got some resources here. Again, we'll put these up there. Um, we've got the uh, networking Kubernetes book where we walk through all of that um, in a much more uh, detailed description. Um, we have the presentation survey here, so please give us feedback. Tell us if we actually accomplished it or if we satisfied your morbid curiosity. And the SIG networking community, Gateway API community, would ask if you are using Gateway API, please take this survey and let us know how it's going. That would be very helpful. So we'll leave this up here for a few seconds. And on time, yeah, 30 on time. minutes. Yay. Any questions? We have six minutes for questions. Or singing. No? Tell me why. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, folks. Sure. Okay, sure. Let me, we are just going to repeat our question then. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the question is like you have several nodes and you have cube procs and all of them and how they communicate with, with each other. So they don't, right? All of the cube proxies, they go to the API server and they say like what kind of rule I need to, to uh, program here, right? And then uh, uh, using that internal routing like pod to pod that you've seen, you actually have your node speaking with the other pod on the other node if it's running on, on the other node, right? But that's the same path. That's the same routing that it, that it happens. But you, you have this extra hope if you get into a node that it's on a different, uh, 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 sorry. Uh, the IPs, it you mean? The, the nodes have their own side of range. So you saw that slash 24, that's assigned to that node. Yeah. But I mean, the bots are spread around the, the 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, but because we, we do that split of like this slash 24, it will know like I'm calling actually something else on some, some different place. There's an underlying assumption that all of the nodes are routable to each other, so that's when it has that route, it knows to go talk to that node. Does that make That's why when we showed the routing rules on the node. Uh, it actually it actually gets the endpoint slices and understands. You mean the IPs that it should program, right? Okay, so it goes to the API server, gets the endpoint slices object, and we, it will know that like, hey, this service slash endpoint slice has these IP addresses. So those are the IPs that I need to program here. Yeah, and then it maps those to the IP tables, NF tables rules. So that's what QProxy is responsible for. S sorry. It depends. So the question is like, if the pod exists on the same service, uh, if the pod exists on the same node that you are calling pro from a node port, right, or eventually internally. So it depends. So there is this flag, which is like internal uh, traffic policy and external traffic policy that you set on the uh, service, that they will say like, when the traffic reaches from the outside to the node, I would just try to send to the same, to any place on the cluster or just to the same place, right? What can happen is actually, uh, first of all, I don't know if there is some kind of prioritization for the pod on the same node when you are using the cluster model. But if you use the local mode, which is this one that will uh, just try to use the local, and you try to reach like a host that doesn't have the pod, it will fail. In that case, it will just break. So usually you use that when you have a load balancer in front of them. So just one will be answering, or just the ones that have the yeah, pod. Yeah, we, we didn't have time to go into external and internal traffic policies. No, it stays inside the node. Yes. If it's external traffic equals to local, it will stay inside the node. Okay. Yeah. For same service for different pods? Yeah, yeah, so we didn't, get sh we didn't dive too much into it. I said like green labels. So you can use label selectors with multiple services. So you can have two services going to the same pods. Is that what? I have one service, but all the ports that have all the services, all the they If they are the same pod, I mean the same pod with different containers with the same port, yes. If you are trying to change, to send to different pods, like you have backend, front end and you want to use the same service, then no, you can't. 